En años recientes, la analítica de datos ha transformado el fútbol a nivel global. Aunque su aplicación más conocida es detectar y reclutar talento, existen otras áreas en la gestión de equipos deportivos donde la ciencia de datos está teniendo un alto impacto. A continuación, Jordan Garner nos brinda un panorama de cómo el análisis de datos sustenta las decisiones de inversión y compra de equipos deportivos. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. It's really um, an honor to kind of open up the sports analytics track. Um, this is a bit of my background. Obviously, I'm not a data scientist. I'm not a PhD. I'm a football executive. Um, I'm a consultant with a company called 21st Group that's out of London. Um, I'll talk a little bit more in a couple of slides about what they do, but they're a data-focused intelligence company with a couple different verticals. The vertical that I work on is related to investment intelligence, and that's about how do clubs make better decisions in terms of allocating financial resources, how do investors look at global football um, in terms of allocating resources more properly and more efficiently. I'm also a minority investor in Swansea City, which is a club in uh, Wales that participates in the championship in the second division in the UK. Uh, I formerly was uh, the chairman and managing partner for a club in Denmark called FC Helsinger. We bought that club in 2019 and sold it in September of last year. So that was a really interesting project. And I also was part of a group, uh, an American group that owned a club in the Republic of Ireland called Dundalk. And I'm not going to talk about that project too much today because I don't have a ton of time, but that was a really interesting project where we looked at a model of European competition in terms of the Europa League and the Champions League and prize money, saying, can we invest in a smaller club in a smaller country in Europe that wins the league pretty much every year and gets a large amount of prize money from European competitions? And so we created a really interesting financial model that each round that we would advance in European competition would meet a certain amount of revenue for the club. And if we advanced a certain point to the group stage, to the quarterfinals, to the semifinals, it would become a very lucrative proposition for the club. So that was a really interesting project that I was on the board of for a short period of time. Um, a little bit of background on the work that I do for 21st Group. I'm a consultant for the company. Um, these are the four verticals that the, the company has, uh, performance intelligence, competition intelligence, fan engagement and investment intelligence. Investment intelligence is the area that I work on. Obviously, most of the company are data scientists and there's a lot of data-based decision-making behind the company, which I find really interesting. You know, the way I look at the use of data in football and in sport is that you know, I'm not here to dig into the numbers and understand where they come from. I'm here to work with really smart, credible people to give me better information to make better decisions as an executive, as a CEO, as an investor when it comes to football and when it comes to sport. So a lot of what I work on on the investment intelligence side is we support potential investors when they're looking at pre-transaction strategies. So we, have, we could have an investor that comes to us and says, I really want to invest in the asset class that is football or European football. I'm not really sure where to put my money. So we would analyze based on a lot of criteria. Is it Spain or is it Italy? Is it the top division? Is it the second division? Are they looking to do a multi-club group? Are they looking to go into women's football? Is it a combination of all of the above? So really it's about putting the pieces together from a data perspective to make better decisions. How do we analyze past financial performance, risk tolerance? I think a lot of times there's a lot of very inefficient decision making in football. It's very agent driven, it's very personal relationship driven, and it's very much like a deck comes across your, your table and says, hey, you know what, uh, X club is for sale. Uh, it's, it's, it's worth X amount of money. Uh, we're working with a broker or an intermediary or an agent, so we're interested in that club. Whereas a lot of the work that I do and the work I do at 21st Group is much more taking three steps back and saying, why do you want to invest in football? Why do you want to own a club? And how much risk tolerance do you have? And how do we allocate your resources properly? Um, this is a little bit of kind of the back end of what 21st Group does. Again, this is not my wheelhouse, but it gives you guys at least from a data perspective, understanding how that they create the intelligence engine to create the data that I use in terms of practical working with clients in, in the real world. So obviously there's a lot of use of external data sources. There's a data warehouse that the company uses and then that spits out the information into the different, the four different verticals. Um, I'm not gonna talk a ton about this because again, I'm not a data scientist. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to show you guys how we take the information that comes out from this engine and we use it to make better decisions. Um, you know, I've been involved in European football now for about five or six years, and there's been, you know, a massive transformation across the industry and the professionalization and the sophistication and how these clubs are run. 
There's more institutional investors coming. There's more private equity. Even nation states and high net worth individuals are coming in saying, how do we make better decisions and how do we use data properly? And obviously, we can use data as a football club or an investor in a hundred different ways, everything from player performance and commercial growth. I think most people, when they think of data in sport, they think of money ball and they think of how are we going to use it to recruit better players. And I think what's most interesting to me and what I'm going to talk about a lot today is the investment intelligence piece of the puzzle. How do we use data to make better decisions from an investment perspective? Um, Investment intelligence really comes down to a couple different spaces. It's, it's investment targets, as I talked about. It's a asset allocation. It's budgeting and financial predictions. And it's really very much taking the emotion out of decision making. There's so much emotion in football. I think whether it's fans or it's sponsors or it's your own staff, if you lose a game and everyone thinks you're going to finish in last place. You win a game and everyone thinks you're going to win the league. I think really the way we look at it is you know, looking at the numbers, looking at the data, and, and kind of merging that with our real world experience on the ground to make better decisions. So one area, an example I'll give you guys where investment intelligence can be really useful is, so uh, a primary club was just bought by an American group about four or five months ago, Bournemouth. It's a, it's a group out of Las Vegas. It's a guy named Bill Foley who owns uh, the Las Vegas Knights, which is an NHL hockey team. And so he bought the club in November, and the club was in the relegation zone and is a, is a club that's typically at a pretty high risk for relegation. And he's sitting there looking towards the winter transfer window saying, how do I allocate my resources in the winter window to give myself the best chance to stay in the Premier League, which is obviously a huge financial decision because the difference between revenue in the Premier League versus the second division is tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of pounds. So the discussion that, that I had with, with his group is looking at Okay, if you're looking to allocate resources, let's just say 30, 40, 50 million pounds in the winter window, what are you gonna get out of that? How is that going to increase or decrease your chances of staying in the Premier League? And each incremental amount of money you spend, assuming you spend it efficiently, will that increase your chances of staying in the Premier League? So I think one of the areas we looked at is, if he spent, I believe, an extra 10 million pounds in the winter window, it only increased his chances of staying in the Premier League by 2%. So. That's obviously a decision he has to make as an investor. Is that a worthwhile allocation of resources for him? Should he be spending that money in other areas? Should he not spend that money at all? So the way I look at it from a data perspective, it's, it, I'm not looking at it to tell him, the data tells me you should spend 43 million pounds in the transfer market, and this is exactly how you use the data. The data is a, a tool that you can use to make better decisions and make decisions more efficiently when you're at high risk of big decisions that can affect the future of your organization. Uh, whoops, went backwards. So this is some of the tools that we use when it comes to 21st group and, and the things I implement in the clubs I'm involved with and the groups that I speak to is, you know, we look at if you want to buy a Premier League club and you're at a mid to bottom table club, which is I think where most of the value proposition is. And you say, you know, I think a lot of foreign ownership groups or American ownership groups would look and say, well, you know, I'm smart. I've run a club in North America really well, so I'm going to make good decisions. And chances I get relegated, it's, it's not high. I'm just going to, I'm going to do good, make good decisions. If you look at it, you know, you can see the team, a team, for instance, in 15th place in the Premier League, over a period of four seasons, there's a two out of three chance you're going to get relegated. So it's going to happen. It's going to happen eventually, especially the teams towards the bottom. If you're buying the team towards the bottom, you know, your chances are almost certain that you're going to get relegated. So that goes to, I, I buy a club and now I have the data in my head knowing, okay, there's a really high likelihood from the data. The data historically is telling me I'm going to get relegated. So I need to prepare for that. I need to put relegation clauses in the contracts that I negotiate with players. I need to understand what the financial model looks like in the second tier and how I'm going to come immediately back up. You know, fortunately, in many European leagues, you have parachute payments, which certainly help uh, soften the blow if you get relegated. But I think burying your head in the sand as a potential investor or executive at a club saying, I'm just never going to get relegated. And it sounds kind of simple. You would assume if you're buying Bournemouth or you're buying Leicester City, who's now at the bottom, that you would assume you would know you would get relegated. But a lot of these groups, they either don't understand the promotion relegation system, or they have a kind of a, a, an arrogance or a confidence that they are smarter than everyone else. And the numbers tell you right here, you know, your club based on historical track records, if you're in the bottom six, seven, eight, will get relegated over a period of time, no matter how smart you are. Um, so I think showing these kind of real world numbers and real world statistics to potential investors gives them a better idea of how they approach the investment. 
This is another piece that I think is really interesting. It's comparing, comparing the relative strengths of leagues in Europe. And this can be used in a variety of ways, including you know, player transfers or whatnot. But when we look at investment intelligence and investors looking at different leagues, we look at historical strength of leagues and say, okay, how do we compare an investment, let's just say, in the third tier to, of France to the second tier in Spain? And, and then we look at valuations of clubs and say, are we getting good value for our investment? And you can also kind of see the spread of the quality in the team. So you look at the fourth tier in Italy, there's a massive spread between the top and the bottom division in terms of the quality you're getting on the pitch. So this is just, again, another interesting tool that gives us a comparative uh, data point when we're, when we're talking about investing in clubs. You look at Italy in terms of the gap between the second and the third tier. That's a really big gap because you're basically going from professional football to semi-professional football. And so you can get a club in the third tier in Italy for a million or two million euros. You jump up to the second tier and it's 10x, 15x in terms of valuation. So you're, you know, certainly that's a piece of data that I think is really important when you're thinking about where do we want to allocate your resources um, in investment, in this case in European football. This, in a similar way, uh, layers in annual wage bill in terms of which leagues are most efficient. And obviously, if you're a sophisticated institutional investor, you're saying, how do I buy clubs or how do I buy a club that's run more efficiently and use my dollars better? I think the thing that becomes immediately apparent in this is the black dots, which is England. And you can see that they are below the line in terms of spending efficiency. So if you look at the fourth tier in England, which is League Two, and if anyone's following Wrexham, that's the league they just got promoted into, the amount that they're spending on their average wage bill is the exact same as the third tier in Italy, the third tier in Spain, and the top tier in Sweden. But the relative quality is significantly less in terms of the players on the pitch. So that comes to um, you know, the amount you can potentially sell players for, the quality on the pitch. So you start to say, look, of course an investor might not decide for whatever reason that the third tier in Spain is where they want to allocate their resources, but you can kind of see and look and decide how I want to allocate my resources in this particular way. Like putting Sweden on here, I think was a was a affirmative choice that I put on here because I think, for instance, Scandinavia from my time in Denmark is an incredibly undervalued market. Now Sweden has ownership restrictions, so that's a, a challenge in terms of investing as a foreign investor. But again, this is not going to tell me yes, I need to go invest in the second tier in the championship. And this is just another one of a piece of data that we use when we're talking to people or we're making internal decisions in terms of uh, looking at different football leagues and in investing in football. So, whoops. These are a couple different graphics that, um, that I've used in terms of ways that we work with current and prospective clubs in terms of making better decisions. The first graphic is Bournemouth, and that's, I, I used that example a little bit earlier. This was from one season prior when they were in the championship in terms of how do their pr probability percentage chances of promotion change throughout the season? And it's really interesting to look because you know, they're basically for the first, they hadn't lost a game until the 16th match day. And for most of the beginning of the season, they were less than a 60% chance of getting promoted. And so again, what does that tell you? That just, tell, that just tells you data points in terms of how are we gonna spend? What are we gonna look at the winter window? And how each individual performance can either significantly change or significantly not change your percentages of promotion and how we use that to make better decisions. The second graphic is a couple of clubs in France. Lens is a club that I'm really familiar with. It's a really, really well-run club. Look, they're in second place in Ligue 1 right now. It looks like they're probably gonna be in European competition. Um, a club from a club wage efficiency perspective is incredibly well efficient and well run. They sell players well, they do things on a low budget, and you can see over a period of the last seven to 10 years, it's increased in terms of their efficiency. 16, 17, I believe, was the year that new ownership came in, so it took them a couple years to kind of get across the line in terms of running the club better, and now they're in a trajectory where they're running the club quite efficiently. PSG, for instance, and it's really interesting this is up here because PSG's financials just came out yesterday and it showed that they lost 370 million euros last year, which is obviously an absurd amount of money. You know, their wage efficiency has gone down over the last 10 years. Now there's other reasons why PSG does what they're doing, um, but that's just an interesting piece of information. If you have an investor that's looking at a club like Lons and saying, how do we run this club more efficiently? We wanna find and identify clubs that are more efficiently run the last piece is related to player transfers in terms of efficiency and player transfers, ingoing and outgoing, saying, you know, we look at historical data in terms of what are the premiums clubs are paying for transfer fees, and are clubs getting more or less than what market rate is in terms of are they leaving money on the table when it comes to player transfers, 
are they getting more than what the market Testing, testing, okay. Sorry about that. The last piece is look again, looking at Italian teams, their efficiency or lack of efficiency in terms of premiums in the transfer market. Um, you can see some clubs hitting well above their weight in terms of what they get for transfer fees and not hitting in terms of capturing the market share when it comes to player transfers. Um, I believe this is the last graphic I have. And again, same kind of thing. We're looking at probabilities in terms of spending and promotion. The first graphic is somewhat similar to what I talked about earlier related to Bournemouth. How much increase in additional spending and player transfers or wages, how does that affect your probability in this case of making the Champions League? Again, another really useful data point. The second graphic is related to a team in the third division in Germany. What are the probabilities that they get promoted based on the amount of wage spending that they have over a three year period. And the last graphic is related to commercial match day and broadcast income and how success on the, sp on the, on the pitch, which is pretty self-explanatory, directly correlates to your revenue. And so increased investment in sporting wages generally leads to a significant increase in other commercial areas. Now, of course, you have to spend efficiently and but you know wait you know ultimately at the end of the day winning in football correlates to a lot of different successful financial metrics in sport so i wanted to leave a lot of time to open up to questions obviously there's a lot of different directions i could have gone here a lot of different things to talk about but um i want to open it up answer any questions on anything i talked about data not data getting into football not getting into football i've you know done a lot of stuff recently in latin america I talked about, I wrote an article last week or the week before about investment in football in South America, which I think is really interesting. So that's somewhat relevant.